From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA Clinical Reviews, interviews and ideas about innovations in medicine, science, and clinical practice. Here's your host. Welcome to listeners around the world, and thank you for tuning in to this JAMA Clinical Review podcast. I am your host, Mary McDermott, Deputy Editor of JAMA, and I'm here today with Dr. Samia Mora, who is Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a cardiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Mora is author of a JAMA Insight on the topic of lipoprotein A. Welcome, Dr. Mora. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. So let's start off by having you tell our audience, what is lipoprotein A and why is it important? So lipoprotein little a is an LDL-like particle. It has cholesterol, triglycerides, and carries an apolipoprotein on its surface. It also has this special component, which is the apo little a, and that is made up of these Kringle type 4 to repeat, which vary by ancestry and by genetics. The LPA particle is similar to LDL in terms of carrying cholesterol, triglycerides, and has an ApoB, but it differs from LDL structurally in carrying also this Apo little a. It has some oxidized lipoproteins on it, and these components are thought to promote atherosclerotic and thrombotic events and to be pro-inflammatory. What is the relationship between LDL and lipoprotein little a? Is lipoprotein little a a subset of LDL, or could you just clarify that for us? No, they are different particles. LPA, like structurally, has components that make it similar to LDL. For example, it's also a lipoprotein particle. It carries cholesterol, triglycerides inside of it and on it, and also carries an ApoB particle on the surface. But it's different because it also carries this Kringle 4 type 2 repeats, and that makes it a different particle. In fact, when we measure LDL cholesterol, or we actually calculate LDL cholesterol in most cases, the LPA cholesterol could be potentially included in it, but you don't really get the LPA level unless you specifically measure LPA little a. So it's possible to have a high LP little a and a low LDL and vice versa. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And also what is considered a high level of LP little a? You know, the risk of LP little a, like the risk for LDL cholesterol with cardiovascular disease is continuous. So what we do know is that higher levels of LPA in a graded fashion will also carry increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So there is no magic threshold. But the guidelines seem to have grown towards a consensus of considering an LPA level measured that's more than 50, 50 milligram per deciliter or more than 125 nanomoles per liter being increased risk at a high LPA level. And of course, the LPA levels vary a lot in populations. So average LPA level in a general population could be around 10 milligram per deciliter, for example, which would be around 30 nanomole per liter or so. The levels vary a lot depending on the population mixture of ancestry and other factors. In terms of the high LPA level, like I said, mostly people consider more than 50 milligram per deciliter or more than 125 nanomoles per liter. And this is also confusing about LPA that we have these two different units. So clinicians have to be more aware of looking not just at the number, but at the units. So is it a milligram per deciliter assay, which is more a mass-based assay? You're measuring the whole mass or the whole weight of the particle versus are you measuring the nanomole per liter, which is counting the number of LPA particles. Can you give us an ideal threshold, recognizing that it should be considered on a continuum, but is there a level that you would want your patients to be lower than ideally? And then could you also give us the magnitude of risk? So someone above 50 has a risk of X of cardiovascular events compared to someone with that ideal low level. 
Yeah. Um, I think if clinicians keep the number 50 milligram per deciliter in mind or 125 nanomol per liter, that's probably the most practical way. The risk does seem to increase around the level of about 30 milligram per deciliter, but we're talking the difference is kind of small. So I would say 50 milligram per deciliter or 125 nanomol per liter to keep that number in mind. In terms of the risk, so around that level, for example, that we just talked about, it's about 40 to 50 percent increased relative risk. Risk. The absolute risk difference would depend on the patient's other cardiovascular risk factors. And if, for example, they have many cardiovascular risk factors and their risk is high, then you would multiply that by about 50% to get the added risk of the LPA. But as I said, as the levels go up further, we get more risk. So once you get to around a level of about 100 milligram per deciliter, for example, then you get about a twofold increased risk. So that person would be twofold increased risk compared to like a general population level of about 10 milligram per deciliter. And if you go higher, then of course the risk increases up to about three to fourfold increased risk with the very highest LPA levels. And would you say this risk factor is similar in magnitude in terms of its importance to other risk factors that we treat every day, like hypertension and high LDL or diabetes? Exactly, Mary. So it turns out that LPA levels don't really correlate with other risk factors. So they really are not correlated. Like you said earlier, if you measure somebody's LDL cholesterol, you'll not know their LPA. You need to actually measure it. And that's because they don't really correlate. And they also don't correlate with blood pressure. They don't correlate with obesity, BMI, other factors that we kind of generally consider cardiovascular risk factors. So that's why it's more of an independent risk factor in that sense. And it's predominantly genetic, so it really depends on what genes we're carrying from our parents. In terms of the risk, so LDL, for example, LDL particles and LDL cholesterol is also continuous risk for cardiovascular events like LPA, and the magnitude of both would depend on the level of risk. And in fact, among individuals, say, with familial hypercholesterolemia, these are individuals who have genetic factors that predispose them to high levels of LDL cholesterol and very high levels. In fact, LPA level can, in those people in particular, carry even greater risk of cardiovascular disease. So they're additive, I would say, in that respect. Or if you want to think about the risk, the risk is multiplicative. Your article talks about the fact that you really only need to measure LP little a once because it's genetically determined and our typical lifestyle modifications don't alter it. But then it also says that LP little a is greater with age. So I was trying to reconcile those two. Should people repeat it as they get older? Or can you talk about that a little bit? We think of LDL cholesterol and LDL in general as the levels being contributed both by lifestyle as environmental factors as well as genetics. For LPA, the contrast is that it's predominantly genetic. So more than 90% of the level is really determined genetically. So lifestyle factors in terms of LPA level don't affect it too much. Now, lifestyle factors in general are what we always recommend to our patients because they reduce overall cardiovascular risk for a particular patient and for all of us. But in terms of the affecting the LPA level itself, they really have minimal impact. So people who want to lower the LPA are often frustrated if they have a high LPA level because there aren't that many good ways to lower it currently. Now, in terms of age, when we're born, the LPA level is is still predominantly genetic, but the level itself increases up until we're about age two. In some people, it can increase up till the child is about five or so, or even up to 10 years old. But predominantly, once after puberty, the levels stabilize. So it doesn't make sense to repeat it because it's predominantly genetic, as long as it was checked around then or after. And there are some cases where an LPA can be high due to secondary causes. These predominantly affect the liver or the kidneys because the liver is where the LPA is produced and the kidneys are where it's cleared. And so, you know, anything that affects those kidney or liver could also potentially affect LPA. But for the most part, again, LPA levels don't change that much with age once you hit puberty. 
for women in particular, when they go through the menopause transition, then the levels can increase a bit, like by about 15% or so. Again, in most people, that's not highly relevant, but women, say, postmenopausal compared to premenopausal, may notice a bit higher level after they go through menopause. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the medications that have been recently reported to reduce LPA? So LPA can be reduced through certain medications that exist currently, but there are also specific LPA-targeted therapies that are now being tested in clinical trials. So those are what everybody is really eager to see the results of, the new medications, which we'll talk about. Before we talk about those, though, I do want to point out that statins do not lower LPA. PCSK9 inhibitors can lower LPA by around 20 to 30 percent. They don't have FDA approval indications specifically for individuals with high LPA because they weren't specifically tested and the trials didn't focus on people with high LPA. But If we cannot reach the LDL or ApoB or non-HDL cholesterol goal, for example, with statins and other medications, then it would be reasonable to use PCSK9 inhibitors among individuals who also have a high LPA. There is also another way to lower it, which is not pharmacological, which is through lipid and lipoprotein apheresis, but that's very cumbersome, but that is also one of the FDA indications for lowering LPA. The new medications that everybody is excited about, and that's why I think LPA in the past few years has really become more known about clinically is because now there have been developed several medications that specifically, so they only target LPA and mostly they target genetically because what they do is they silence the production of the LPA particle in the liver. There are two types. There is an antisense oligonucleotide, ASO, therapeutics, and then there is silencing RNA, so siRNA therapeutic, and both target the production of the messenger RNA, and so you don't have the ApoA component, and it's the ApoA component that we said was different about the LPA particle. So then you don't get the LPA particle. These are injectable medications. There is another novel agent that was also recently tested, and that's a small molecule inhibitor, also targets LPA production. That targets the production also in the liver of the molecule coming together, and that's an oral agent. Is the oral agent just as effective as the injectable? The injectable medications, what we've seen from the phase two and phase one trials, is that they can lower up to 80 or even 99% now in terms of the LPA level. The oral seems to be more in the range of 65 to 70% with the data we've seen so far. Like I said, all these agents have not yet published the trials that we really want to know, which are the clinical outcomes trials. These are the phase three that test these agents for clinical outcomes, which specifically include myocardial infarction, stroke, cardiovascular death, the outcomes that we're used to, the MACE outcomes. So just to clarify that important point, what is known about the effects of these medications on cardiovascular events? So that is what we don't know yet. We're actually eagerly anticipating because they're currently mostly in phase two and three clinical trials. So we do know that they lower LPA really effectively. So they're great at lowering LPA. But that's still the missing link that we're waiting for is do they also lower risk of cardiovascular events. And that's what we're actually hoping that we'll find that out in the next year or two for at least several of them that are being tested. And also the phase three trials all are examining patients who have high LPA levels to start with. So these are being conducted, which makes sense, kind of like the statin and earlier LDL lowering trials that were conducted among individuals who had high LDL. Currently, the current trials, phase three, are among patients who have high LPA. And are they among people with cardiovascular disease, or is it more primary prevention in those ongoing trials? Mostly, they're among people who are secondary prevention, so they already have evidence of cardiovascular disease. There is one trial, one phase three, that also is including primary prevention, but they're high risk. But that's important also to know among patients who 
have high LPA but haven't had yet a cardiovascular event if these agents will reduce cardiovascular events. But like I said, there are three studies. For example, there's the LPA horizon testing pelocarsin. There's the Ocean A outcomes, which is testing alpacerin. And these are for secondary prevention. And then there's the Acclaim LPA trial, which is testing lipodiseron. And that one is also predominantly secondary prevention, but does include in it high-risk primary prevention. And all these three phase three trials, all of them only enrolling patients who have high LPA. By high, I mean even higher than the cut point I mentioned earlier. These trials are really enrolling more than 70 milligram per deciliter. So it ends up being more than about 175 or 200 nanomoles per liter in that range. Which of the drugs that you mentioned is the oral drug? Actually, the oral drug is not yet in phase three. That's mevalapolin, and that's still in phase two trials. And then what are the adverse effects of these drugs, the common ones? The injectables may have some side effects just at the site of injection, but from the phase two and phase one trials, these agents seem pretty safe. Of course, we need longer-term trials, and that's why the phase three trials are important, even post-marketing if these agents go to market. But so far, they seem to be safe. There is some data that actually we had found earlier in our work showing that very, very low levels of LPA, by that we mean less than five milligram per deciliter. So really low levels of LPA carry increased risk of type 2 diabetes So we don't know if patients will get to such low levels of LPA in the trials and whether or not that will be associated with increased risk of diabetes, but that is definitely something that is being monitored in the clinical trials. So far, we haven't heard of any notable safety adverse events that have been reported on, but we have to wait for the publication of the studies. In 2025, who should get their LP little a checked and why? So the guidelines and national societies have grown towards a consensus, which is that everyone should get a one-time LPA test. We'll see the cholesterol guidelines. We'll see what they say. But most of the other National Lipid Association, the American Heart Association statements, and European guidelines have coalesced on everybody should get their LPA level checked once at least. Now, in most people, you only need to check it once, like I said, because it's genetically determined. So there's no no real utility from rechecking it, unless there was something very specific going on, like if a patient had nephrotic syndrome or significant liver disease, something like that. But for the most part, only once would be sufficient. And at this point, we recommend that it should be done in somebody who hasn't had it before. So that could be an adult. And moving forward, if one does identify somebody with a, especially a very high LPA level, we also have seen the recommendations that we should do cascade screening, meaning if that patient is identified that has a very high level, then getting their first-degree relatives checked as well is also important to identify them and to discuss with them their risk. Because like I said, the risk could be potentially up to three- or four-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease, depending on the level, and that risk will compound with the patient's other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So if they happen to have other risk factors like smoking or hypertension or diabetes or poor diet, etc., then all these factors will compound, and that patient could have potentially really high risk for cardiovascular disease. And so all our efforts should be dedicated towards lowering that risk. I'm Mary McDermott, and I've been speaking today with Dr. Samia Mora about her JAMA Insight article on the topic of lipoprotein little a. You can find a link to the article in this episode's description. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com or search for JAMA Network wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening. This content is protected by copyright by the American Medical Association with all rights reserved, including those for text and data mining, AI training, and similar technologies.